As you may already know, Saudi Arabia is famous for being the largest sand desert, with harsh climate change and little to no rainfall. How has Saudi Arabia been coping with these excessive limitations? Today, we will be revealing a miraculous phenomenon that will keep you amazed because it's nothing as you've seen before. Saudi Arabia's agricultural development has left the world astonished and unbelievably shocked scientists all over the globe. Stay glued to this video to discover all the facts. Look deep into the history of Saudi Arabia. You will see that Saudi Arabia is a nation in Western Asia formerly known as the State of Saudi Arabia. It is the second largest Arab nation in Western Asia and the Middle East and encompasses most of the Arabian Peninsula. With a land area of about 2 million, 150,000 kilometers square, it is also the fifth largest country in Asia. But did you know despite being a very popular country, Saudi Arabia has long been faced with the problem of desertification. There are forests, grasslands, mountain regions, and deserts in Saudi Arabia, which have diverse topography. Regional temperature variations exist. In the summer, the desert can hit over 110 degrees Fahrenheit, while in the north and center of the nation, it can get below freezing in the winter. But recently, a miraculous turnaround has happened, and Saudi Arabia has used numerous modern technologies to solve its problem and turned many of its desert areas into green farmland. The typical annual rainfall in Saudi Arabia is only 4 inches. Saudi Arabia is one of the world's water-scarce countries, even though 97% of its population has access to drinkable water. 500 cubic meters per person per year is the absolute water shortage threshold. Only 89.5 cubic meters per person are produced annually in Saudi Arabia. Even though the kingdom has high water access rates, severe overconsumption, and a lack of trustworthy renewable water sources have elevated this problem to a top priority. The most valuable natural substance in Saudi Arabia, in the opinion of many, is oil. Water, however, is becoming more valuable due to the water problem in Saudi Arabia. The oceans and groundwater, which are quickly depleting, are the two main water sources. In addition, 98% of all naturally occurring freshwater is contained in the earth. In Saudi Arabia, each makes up 50% of the water utilized. How is Saudi Arabia surviving the whole water scarcity in terms of agriculture? Over the past three decades, agriculture in Arabia has advanced astonishingly. In a nation with one of the lowest rainfall rates in the world, with an average of only four inches annually, large sections of the desert have been converted into agricultural fields. Today, Saudi Arabia sends various goods to markets worldwide, including wheat, dates, dairy products, eggs, fish, poultry, fruits, vegetables, and flowers. Previously a mainstay of the Saudi diet, dates are now primarily grown for international humanitarian assistance. Agriculture policy is mainly the responsibility of the Ministry of Agriculture. Other government organizations include the Grain Silos and Flour Mills Organization, which buys and stores wheat, builds flour mills, and creates livestock feed, and the Saudi Arabian Agricultural Bank, Saab, which distributes subsidies and offers interest-free loans. Additionally, the government finances research projects and provides land distribution and reclamation programs. The private sector has significantly aided the growth of agriculture in the kingdom. This is large because of government initiatives that provided long-term, interest-free loans, technical assistance, support services, financial incentives like free fertilizer and seeds, inexpensive water, fuel, and electricity, and duty-free equipment and raw materials imports. Except for a short coastal strip in the southwest, the Arabian Peninsula's agriculture historically consisted mainly of date farming and small-scale vegetable production in dispersed oases. The local communities received enough food from small plots, and any surplus was sold to traveling caravans. In the 1970s, significant agricultural growth started. In addition to building rural roads, irrigation networks, 
storage facilities, and export facilities. The government also started a comprehensive program to support agricultural research and training institutions. As a consequence, the production of all staple foods has increased dramatically. Meat, milk, and eggs are just a few commodities in which Saudi Arabia is currently entirely self-sufficient. Of course, Saudi Arabian farmland depends on water. The vast water supplies required to achieve the tremendous development of the agricultural sector were successfully provided by the kingdom by implementing a multifaceted program. A network of dams has been constructed to capture and make use of valuable periodic floods. Through deep wells, huge underground water reservoirs have been accessed. Desalination facilities have been constructed to create fresh water from the ocean for use in cities and industry, freeing up other sources for farming. Additionally, infrastructure has been put in place to handle industrial and urban runoff for agricultural irrigation. Large swaths of the desert have been converted into productive farmland due to all these endeavors. In 1976, there were fewer than 400,000 acres of land under agriculture. By the 21st century, there were millions of acres. What's astonishing is that although the majority of Saudi Arabia's terrain is covered by desert, a surprisingly large number of indigenous plant species are able to withstand the harsh climate. Now, under the umbrella of the Saudi Green Initiative, efforts are underway to preserve and even increase the amount of vegetation across the kingdom. From its desert vistas in the north to the southern region of Acer, the kingdom is home to an abundance of vegetation, including more than 2,000 wild plant species belonging to 142 families. According to the Saudi National Center for Wildlife, however, about 600 of these species are classified as endangered and 21 are already thought to be extinct. The SGI recently announced the largest afforestation project the country has ever seen, with a target of planting 450 million trees in the coming years. And currently about 10 million trees have already been planted across all of the kingdom's 13 regions. Forests aren't the first ecosystem that comes to mind when one thinks of Saudi Arabia. Nevertheless, the kingdom is home to about 2.7 million hectares of woodland, mostly in the southwest's inaccessible mountains of Ava and Asa. On the surface, planting 450 million trees may appear ambitious, let alone the planned greening of the desert, particularly in light of the kingdom's rapid urbanization. But in reality, the Saudi government has established specific SGI objectives to integrate green areas harmoniously into urban growth, including parkland and afforestation within the bounds of the kingdom's desert cities, to counter the potential harm of urban sprawl. These cities' unmanaged surfaces will be greened, which will not only help to slow down global warming, but also reduce carbon dioxide emissions, enhance air quality, open up possibilities for more active lifestyles, and sustainably beautify cities. Meanwhile, in more rural areas, the greening initiatives must contend with encroaching desertification, scarce water supplies, and record high temperatures, all of which are considered to be the result of human-caused climate change. The SGI roadmap aims to safeguard the kingdom's distinctive biodiversity, stop and reverse desertification and soil degradation, and keep the nation's limited water resources where rainfall is insufficient and groundwater is depleted. Currently, 15 places in Saudi Arabia are protected due to their biodiversity. 12 are on land, and three are in the sea. According to the National Center for Wildlife, this number would be raised to 75, with 62 on land and 13 in coastal and aquatic regions. Approximately 6% of the kingdom's total surface area is covered by the King Salman Royal Nature Reserve in northern Saudi Arabia. About 300 different animal species live there, along with rare archaeological heritage sites, some of which date back as far as 8000 BC. It also contains mountainous terrain, vast plains, and high plateaus. With the assistance of volunteers and in collaboration with Madan, 
The Reserve's administration recently planted 100,000 seedlings as part of an initiative by the Reserve's authority and partners to support SGI's objectives. According to a KSRNR spokesperson, Saudi Arabia is dedicated to increasing the vegetation cover, as we have already accomplished by planting 600,000 plants and having many seed sowing campaigns to increase the vegetation in reserve. Perennial trees and shrubs restore the ecosystems damaged by the desert. These plants are endemic to the habitats of the desert and have evolved to withstand harsh conditions, such as drought and high temperatures, and they don't need a lot of water for irrigation. The primary nursery installation is just one of many projects that make up the reserve's strategic goal to create a seeding program. Water, however, continues to be a significant obstacle to conservation efforts and green initiatives in the kingdom. The people of the Arabian Peninsula developed freshwater wells over the years to sustain life and survive storms. After the economic boom that the kingdom experienced in the 1970s, Saudis gradually adopted modern farming techniques and began progressively using groundwater resources. Saudi Arabia built seawater desalination plants in its eastern and western coastal regions to support inland cities. The country lacks rivers and natural lakes and receives very little annual rainfall to replenish sources. However, there is an increasing need for freshwater and natural aquifers quickly run dry. Therefore, the Saudi government is looking into ways to protect and utilize its water resources more effectively to continue meeting the demands of a developing economy while maintaining well-watered green areas. The King Abdullah University of Science and Technology Center for Desert Agriculture's Maria Nava, a scientific advisor for Green Arabia, told Arab News that the SGI's strategic team will probably use treated wastewater to irrigate recently planted vegetation. She added that another objective is to reduce rainfall loss to the sea or through sand infiltration by the introduction and enhancement of water harvesting in the kingdom and remediation of soil for water retention where necessary. According to Nava, plants growing in urban regions typically require much more water and canopy coverage to provide shade than those growing in mountainous, wadi, and desert climates. She continued that this vegetation needs more water than arid trees, which are drought resistant and have fewer leaves. The traditional diet of the nation has been changed by changes in agriculture, which now provide a variety of local foods that were unthinkable just a few generations ago. Dates are still a significant supplementary meal in Saudi Arabia, but are no longer the essential staple they once were. A large portion of the 450 various types of dates produced each year, estimated to be around half a million tons, is used for international humanitarian assistance. Tens of thousands of tons of dates are donated annually to help alleviate famine and food shortages, primarily through the World Food Programme WFP, of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. One factory in Al Husa is completely devoted to producing dates for foreign assistance, FAO. The WFP food assistance provided by Saudi Arabia has directly benefited many nations, and the kingdom is the second largest donor to the initiative after the United States. The government's numerous initiatives, such as the supply of soft loans with low interest rates and technical and support services, have played a significant role in the agricultural sector's development in Saudi Arabia over the past few years. Low-cost water, fuel, and electricity, as well as duty-free equipment and raw materials imports, have helped the agricultural sector. Tax exemptions for up to 10 years are provided to foreign joint venture partners of Saudi individuals or businesses, and additional incentives have been provided by the investment rules since April 2000. The Ministry of Agriculture is the main body in charge of carrying out agricultural policy. It aids farmers with research and extension work. The Saudi Arabian Agricultural Bank, Saab, which distributes assistance and extends interest-free loans, is another assisting organization. To build flour mills, buy and stockpile wheat, and create an animal feed to support the expansion of agriculture across the country, 
The Grain Silos and Flour Mills Organization was founded in 1972. Saudi Arabia has committed significant financial resources to enhance the roads that connect producing regions with consumer marketplaces to promote private investment in the agricultural sector. Additionally, the 1968 launched Land Distribution and Reclamation Program seeks to distribute fallow land for free, typically in small plots, to expand the area under cultivation and promote crop and livestock production. Within two to five years, the beneficiaries must cultivate at least 25% of the total land area. When the farmer complies, he is given complete ownership of the land. With a focus on diversification and increased efficiency, the government continues to support new farmers as they execute capital-intensive projects under the development plans. The government also funds and supports research initiatives to create new food crops to increase harvest and plant strains with higher pest resistance to increase farm productivity. At agricultural research centers located at Saudi Arabian universities and colleges, these programs are carried out in collaboration between local farmers and scientists. It was a remarkable accomplishment for a nation that must import 90% of its fresh food. The easy addition of clay and water had transformed the harsh, desolate Arabian desert into a lush orchard. Parts of Egypt's Nile Delta ceased thriving in the 1980s. Despite being close to the desert, it had long been a dependable location to farm because of its reputation for fertility. Due to its productivity, the ancient Egyptians shifted their focus from subsistence cultivation to creating a strong civilization that gave rise to cultural achievements that are still celebrated thousands of years later. However, despite sustaining communities in the area for millennia, that fecundity vanished in just a few short years. The Nile would spread onto the plains of the Egyptian Delta in late summer each year before subsiding again. When researchers looked into what had happened to the fertility of the land, they found that the floodwaters had brought minerals, nutrients, and most importantly, clay particles from the East African drainage basin that supplied the Nile and had spread them out across the Delta lands. The soil's resilience and fecundity were both a result of the clay. Where had it gone though? Rewinding to 10 years ago in the 1960s, southern Egypt was constructing the Aswan Dam across the Nile. Built to produce hydroelectricity and control flooding so farming could become more manageable and predictable. This amazing structure is 2.5 miles 4 kilometers, broad. But it also halted the downstream flow of all that beneficial material. Without this yearly top-up, the fertility in the estuary soils would have been depleted after 10 years. The issue was identified by soil scientists and engineers, and they also had the beginnings of a solution. Ole Savitsen, chief executive of Desert Control, the Norwegian company that created the nano clay method, it's like what you might see in your yard. Thin soils with little organic matter fail to retain moisture or support plant growth. The proper amounts of clay present can significantly alter all that. According to Desert Control, using nano clay will transform barren desert territory from sand to hope. Farmers have been using clay to enhance soils for thousands of years, so it's nothing new. However, traditionally, it has been very labor-intensive and destructive to underground ecosystems to work thick, heavy clay into the soil. The environmental expense of plowing, excavating, and turning the soil also results from sequestered carbon being exposed to oxygen and released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. In addition, cultivation disturbs the incredibly intricate soil biome, as Saren Sodi, a soil scientist at the University of Edinburgh says. Did you know that Saudi Arabia is searching for what may be more valuable than oil? It has used buried water supplies for the past 24 years to cultivate wheat and other products in the Syrian desert. Images from three different Landsat satellites run by NASA and the US Geological Survey data are displayed in this time series of data. The desert's green crops were irrigated with partially trapped water during the last ice age. This fossil water flooded aquifers that are now deeply buried beneath the shifting sands of the desert, 
in addition to rainwater that dropped over several hundred thousand years. By drilling through the desert floor, Saudi Arabia can access these underground rivers and lakes, immediately irrigating the crops with a sprinkler system. The center pivot irrigation method is what it is termed. Water is a non-renewable resource in this region because rainfall is currently only a few centimeters, about one inch per year. Hydrologists predict that it will only be cost-effective to pump water for about 50 years, even though no one knows how much water is beneath the arid. The agricultural areas are about one kilometer, 62 miles, across these four Landsat images. The short wave infrared, near infrared, and green portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, bands 7, 4, and 2 from Landsat 4 and 5 TM, and Landsat 7 ETM plus sensors, were used to generate the images. Healthy foliage appears bright green using this set of wavelengths, whereas dry vegetation appears orange. Urban regions, like the town of Tabajal at the top of each image, have a purple color, and barren soil is dark pink. Micro-irrigation uses small quantities of water close to the plants, sprinkler systems, which use nozzles to spray water, and gravity systems, which flood the field or use furrows to channel water, are examples of irrigation technologies. Farmers may also prevent over-irrigation by using techniques like irrigation timing. To assist with irrigation scheduling optimization, farmers can also use precision agriculture technologies like soil moisture sensors, computer or smartphone decision support tools, and remote control of irrigation equipment. To increase farm profitability, farmers implement and use effective irrigation systems that increase crop yields while lowering input costs. We did not discover much proof that water conservation was a factor in technology adoption, but increasing profits and lowering risks are two factors that drive farmer adoption of irrigation technology. Small farm size, high capital expenditures, and a lack of knowledge about the technologies are obstacles preventing the adoption of more efficient technology. Lack of connectivity, such as limited access to broadband, can be a barrier to precision agriculture tools, especially in rural regions. Since its debut in 1982 until 1993, Landsat 4 has produced scientific data. NASA launched Landsat 5 in 1984, and it operated for a record-breaking 28 years, bringing back data in 2011 that was most likely its final transmission. Landsat 7 was launched in 1999 and is still operational. Our knowledge of forest health, storm damage, agricultural trends, urban development, and many other ongoing changes to our land has improved thanks to data from these and other Landsat satellites. Landsat is jointly managed by NASA and the U.S. Department of the Interior through the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, which also maintains a 40-year archive of Landsat images publicly accessible online. Talking about how agriculture is the goldmine in Saudi Arabia's desert, one third of the world's land surface is made up of deserts, characterized by little to no precipitation, poor and sandy soil, extremely high temperatures, scorching winds, limited water catchment potential, and a near total dependence on frequently non-renewable groundwater. Yet millions of people rely on deserts for their living, but deserts' food networks and agrobiodiversity are in danger, which is why ICADA is needed to systematically and sustainably change desert agriculture. ICADA assists in designing, promoting, and scaling out of integrated desert family farming systems, IDSAT, which combines traditional farming practices and nature-based solutions with affordable and useful technologies. According to Dr. Jacques Weary, the Deputy Director of Research at ICADA, many novel technologies used in desert environments such as net houses, hydroponic, and drip irrigation systems, have increased crop output while reducing water and energy use. He continued, the effect is far larger than any individual intervention by integrating these technologies with local knowledge 
and including stakeholders from the public sector, the private sector, the value chain, and the farmers themselves. 44% of the world's food, including half its livestock, is produced in dry areas. Of the 2.7 billion people that live in the drylands, it is estimated that about 40 million live in deserts that typically receive under 100 millimeters of rainfall a year. For many countries in these regions, desert farming is the only source of food production and employment in agri-food systems. Nevertheless, several variables that, when combined, create a perfect storm pose a serious threat to the viability of delicate desert agriculture. The outlook for the family farmers who live there is bleak due to several factors, including climate change, population pressures, improper land management techniques, extreme temperatures, low soil fertility, limited availability of organic matter, water scarcity and salinity, wind erosion, high evaporation rates, and isolation from markets and energy sources. But despite these threats, decades of research and technological development have meant that desert agriculture is no longer confined to isolated patches, such as oses, and has made great strides forward. Except for a few technologies and crop types, the quantity of water farmers applied to an area with more efficient technology remains constant. According to GAO's analysis of survey data on farms that switched to more efficient irrigation systems. One such instance is the transition to micro-irrigation in orchards and vineyards, where less water was applied per acre. Since efficient technology gives farmers more freedom to increase irrigated land or move to crops that require more water, it may increase water use. A policy objective of reducing the impact of irrigated agriculture in areas of the United States experiencing water scarcity was specified in the request for GAO to perform this research. With that objective in mind, GAO listed several options that federal policymakers could take into account. Number one is to encourage the use of irrigation techniques and equipment that are more effective, like irrigation scheduling. Number two encourages using precision agriculture tools like weather monitors and soil moisture sensors. In many places, agriculture has expanded to marginal and degraded desert lands previously considered unfit for food production. The advancement in desert agriculture is largely attributable to an efficient portfolio of protected agriculture practices and technologies created by research institutions like ICADA, a part of CGIAR, the largest agriculture research network in the world, and motivated by private sector business interests. Desalination technology renewable energy, especially solar, water-saving technology, greenhouse systems, and alternative feed sectors have made it possible to produce food even in the aridest soil and under extreme circumstances. In addition, the willingness of many nations, states, and governments to develop supportive policies that encourage desert farming, to lessen their reliance on food imports, and to promote added value export goods, like organic produce, has contributed to the growth of desert farming, which includes the production of horticulture, date palms, irrigated forages, rangeland rehabilitation, protected agriculture, livestock, and fish. However, due to the absence of rain, raising livestock and growing trees or crops in the desert are only possible if water is pumped from aquifers for irrigation making this the most important factor in desert agriculture and by far the greatest task. In some places, the only water that is accessible is non-renewable or too salty to apply directly to crops. Therefore, any expansion of desert agriculture must include thoughtful long-term groundwater control. What did you think about this turnaround in Saudi Arabia? Let us know your comments in the comment box. If you still need to subscribe to this channel, please do so, hit the notification bell, hit the like button, and remember to check out more videos. See you next time.